You ever feel like the world is trying to lie to you? I feel like that all the time, right? Like everybody has an agenda. And like I, I honestly sometimes feel like I have no idea who I can trust or who is just lying straight to my face. And maybe the world's getting worse or maybe I'm just getting older, but I'm, I feel that more and more. Right? I'm so hesitant to listen to anybody, especially anybody with power or anybody who wants power. Because what if they're trying to get me, right? Or what if they're trying to trick me? Or maybe you find yourself in a different category where maybe you listen too quickly to everybody. And maybe you trust too fast. And maybe you're the kind of person who thinks that everybody has your best interest in mind. And really, either side is a mistake. On the one hand, if we never listen to anybody with new ideas, then we never grow and we never learn and we just stay stuck where we are. But on the other hand, if we just trust anyone, we end up lost and confused and hurt by bad people. The book of Galatians was written to people in that last category. But they were gullible. They listened too quickly. They were spiritually vulnerable. And they caught, get caught up in some false ideas. And they got enslaved to old systems. And they ended up farther from God than where they started. And that's what we're going to read today. We're going to learn from Paul how it is that we navigate this world where people are trying to deceive us. And, and how we can listen and how we can learn and how we can sift and how we can understand without being deceived. So that's what we're going to read today. Galatians 5, 7 through 12. Let me read this to us and then we'll pray and then we'll get into it. It says this, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Let me pray for us. Lord God. We ask that you would open this text up to us today. That you would speak to us from your word and that we would know you better. That we would be better equipped to navigate. That we would, that we would be ready to face the world. And that you would make us more and more like Jesus. And we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today what I think we have here is four, what I want us to pull out of this is four defenses against false teachers. Because like I said, the Galatians have been infiltrated by false teachers. And they were kind of like spiritual babies, right? They had just become Christians probably a year or two years before that church had just been planted. And these weren't like a bunch of Christians who joined together to build a church. These were pagans who got saved. And that's what they were, was this little fledgling church. They were new. And they were fresh. And these false teachers came in and tricked them. And so I think he gives us four defenses against false teachers. That's what I want us to look at today. The first one is this. Stay grounded in the Bible. Stay grounded in the Bible. Stay grounded in the Bible. Verse 7, he says, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? He uses this metaphor of a race. Right? They were running well. But then somebody like jumped off the sidelines and tackled them. And it was these false teachers who had come in and insisted on a change. Right? They kept them from obeying the truth. They distracted them from the actual race and got them onto the sidelines. But what is the truth that he's talking about? That's important that we understand. Well, it's the gospel, right? It's the gospel. It's the apostles' teachings. It's the contents of the New Testament, which was being written at the time, but wasn't yet finished. But they didn't have a Bible that they could open and read, necessarily. They had these letters from the apostles that were being circulated and sent around. But they didn't have the benefit of everybody having their own scriptures. And so, for us, now that the New Testament is completed for us, we get to stay grounded in scripture, and we must stay grounded in scripture. Because if the Galatians had paid more careful attention and grounded their minds in the things that had been confirmed among them by the power of God, 
then they wouldn't have been deceivable and they wouldn't have been tricked. They would, have, they would not have wandered away to the weird ideas of the Judaizers because they would have been inoculated, in a sense, by the truth. And the same is true for us, right? In this world where so many people have so many ideas, it's easy for us to get confused and deceived and drawn away into what is exciting and shiny, right? But the Bible serves as a medicine for our minds and our hearts. It's like a vaccine that strengthens our spiritual immune systems against every false idea. And the more we read Scripture, the more the Holy Spirit applies the truth to our hearts. And the less tempting false ideas seem, and the less tempting sin seems, because we're grounded in the truth. It's the truth of the Bible. If you have bad allergies, you know how important it is that you take your allergy medicine, right? I have horrible allergies, and I hate to take medicine of any kind. Like, it just offends me. But... If I don't use my nose spray every morning and I don't take my pill every morning, it doesn't get built up, right? It it falls, it falls apart. My immune system or whatever it is, my antihistamine system, it's just not built up properly. And so storm blows in and I'm dead, right? And I'm suffering. And it's not like I can just go and do the nose spray that day and then I'm fine. Like it has to, it has to build up. That's how it works. The same thing kind of works for the Bible for us. The more that we the more that we take it in, the more that we fill our hearts with it, the more that it builds up in us. And it does fade away. It really does. I mean, you probably experienced this, right? Where maybe you're going strong, you're, you're reading your Bible every day, maybe multiple times a day. It changes you, right? You just are stronger in Christ. You're just filled with the truth. And then you break the habit. Something happens. You go on vacation or some crisis happens and you get out of the habit. And then pretty soon... You're like, I haven't read my Bible in a month. What happened? And you find yourself confused by all these new ideas that are coming in because you've gotten out of the habit and you're not grounded in the truth. He continues in verse 8. He says, This persuasion is not from Him who calls you. And this is a direct reference to Jesus, who is the one who had called the Galatians out of darkness and into light. Right? And what He's essentially saying to them is this. You guys know Christ. And it should be obvious to you that this new old system is not Christ. This is not from Him. Circumcision, the old law, this is not the way that you learn Jesus. Jesus says something similar in John 10, 27. He says, My sheep hear My voice and I know them and they follow Me. My sheep hear My voice and I know them and they follow Me. And the idea there being that those who belong to Jesus, those who are His sheep, they recognize the voice of the shepherd. And there's something about this hearing that's based on the context of John 10 that is deep and innate and Holy Spirit inspired and not necessarily from us, but for us who have, compl- who have, who have this finished word of God, we have the additional opportunity and responsibility to cultivate that hearing and to hear the voice of God. As we read the Bible, we hear his voice. We learn what Jesus sounds like. And the more we read and understand and apply and love God's word, the clearer that voice of God becomes to us because we hear it all the time in the Scriptures. And what I mean by that is that when we hear new ideas then and we hear new teachers and we hear people trying to tempt and deceive and persuade us, we're able to sense really quickly and easily that's not from God. right? When you constantly are filling your mind and your heart and your soul with God's Word, you can just sense that is not from God. Romans 12.2 says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What's interesting here to me is that he says the renewal of your mind. Your mind. Not your heart, although that's part of it. Not your soul, although that's part of it. But here he says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Like your whole way of thinking, your framework, your philosophy, your worldview. And that renewal comes, as we know, I think, as we bathe ourselves in the Word of God. As we fill our mind with God's thinking and God's thoughts and God's words, we become transformed. We really do. And our minds are renewed. And then we're able to test and to discern what is from God and what isn't. And this is so helpful and essential because on the one hand, if we're jaded and cynical, this allows us to listen to people without fear. So if you're like me and you just distrust everybody by default, well, if you're grounded in the truth, 
you don't have to worry that you're going to be led astray. Right? You can still approach someone with caution, which we'll talk about in a second. But you can listen and test and not be afraid that you're going to be led astray. But then on the other side, if you're gullible and easily drawn in by anybody who calls himself a Christian, then being grounded in the truth of the Bible protects you from those people who aren't really speaking the truth and who aren't from God. And so it protects us from the ditches on both sides so we can approach new ideas with the mind of God. Here's a second defense. Approach new teachers with caution. And that's number two. Approach new teachers with caution. Now, this is not explicitly stated, but I think it's implied in verse 9, where he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that's this weird phrase that just seems kind of out of context, but it's a reference to bread making, where a little yeast is all it takes to make bread rise. If you've ever made bread, you know that all you need is a little bit. And that's what the false teachers were, a little yeast. And if they didn't act quickly, then the whole Galatian church was going to be infested by their heresies. And so there's this urgent seriousness about what was going on in Galatia. Because this false gospel of legalism was a cancer that was going to rob them of all of their hope and peace and joy. And they thought they were pursuing God, but as we've already read, they were actually on the path away from God. And the Apostle Paul is telling them, get rid of these false ideas. Don't don't put them into your mind and heart and soul. Don't be deceived by them because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Toss them out. Get rid of these false teachers. We we'll see this exact same phrase, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, in 1 Corinthians 5, which is in reference to a horrible sin that was going on in the midst of the church there. I'm going to read you a couple of verses out of this passage. It says, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, he says, It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Shouldn't you rather mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And then he goes, skips down to verse 6. He says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And the idea there of that passage is get the leaven out. That was part of the Passover, right? The festival of unleavened bread. That's what they called it. Where they remembered that time in Egypt where the angel of death passed over God's people for that final plague. And where they left Egypt so quickly after that that they didn't have time to let the bread rise. That was kind of the idea. And so they would have this continual feast every year of unleavened bread. And one of the things they would do is they would cleanse all the leaven out of their houses. That was part of the preparation. And get rid of all of it. So that they would be very sure that this bread they were going to make would be unleavened. And the point, again, was this holiness thing. That God was doing these amazing things through all of these festivals, but that was part of it. So now we're able to use this metaphor here in the New Testament to say, hey, be pure, not just in your life, but in your doctrine. Get the old leaven out so that you can be what you really are, a new lump. And that's a funny word, but you get the idea, this lump of bread, this dough that's ready to be cooked. And I think the lesson for us is pretty simple here. It's that we want to make sure we don't end up leavened. Right? We want to approach false teachers with caution, if you approach them at all. It's okay, it's okay, I'm just, let me say this, it is okay and good to evaluate a preacher or a teacher before you listen to them. It's okay to evaluate their ministry and the fruit of their life and to say, you know what, I don't, I'm not going to listen to them. I'm not going to listen to them anymore. You're not obligated to chew up the meat and spit out the bones. You're just not. Because a little leaven sometimes leavens the whole lump. And sometimes the right thing to do is to remove a certain teacher from your rotation or to remove a bunch of teachers who teach false ideas out of your rotation. Now, I'm not going to name names because I don't know how helpful that is. It just tends to offend people. But consider if someone constantly tells you 
that God intends every Christian to be perfectly healthy and wildly wealthy in this life, maybe they're not trustworthy at all. Because Jesus was clear on riches. Let me read you Matthew 19, 23 and 24. After he talked to the rich young ruler, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What he means there at base level is that riches are dangerous to Christians. Not necessarily sinful on their own. We know that money is neutral, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils, right? But it's certainly not the path of every Christian to be rich. Jesus was poor. He, did, he tells uh, one of the guys who wanted to come follow him in Luke, he says, birds have houses, or excuse me, birds have nests, foxes have holes. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so maybe we be careful of those people. Approach with caution. I'm not saying you can't listen to people who have those ideas, but be careful. Or if you hear a teacher saying that God is not a trinity, and maybe that's somebody you need to just avoid altogether. They may say some true things, but if they're wrong about the very nature of God, then how much of them can we actually trust? Or if you hear a preacher saying Jesus gave up his divinity to come and be with us, that is false, and it signals that they're not careful enough to be trusted. Or if they say that anything besides a man and a woman married together for life is acceptable and holy, don't trust them. Or that God can bless abortions, do not trust them. Or whatever other clearly unbiblical thing they might say. The point is, be cautious. Be cautious. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You do not have to like and listen to every so-called Christian preacher. You just don't. And just because they're on the TV or the radio does not mean that they're worth listening to. And so again, to go back to these two kinds of people I think we have. You have the cynic on the one side, that's me, who says... Uh, everyone is, is untrustworthy. <laughs> That's not healthy. Right? So we can, say, we can approach any preacher with caution. Just with caution. Don't immediately trust and believe everything you hear somebody say. Test it against the Word of God. Make sure they're not full of leaven. And then on the other side, if you're one of these people, like I said, who just trusts every Christian preacher, well, have a little caution. Be careful. Don't get your doctrine leavened by false ideas. Here's number three. Remember, remember that false teachers will be judged by God. Remember that false teachers will be judged by God. And Paul was hopeful for the Galatians. And that's why he wrote to them rather than writing them off. And what he says is, in verse 10, he says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. I have confidence that you'll take no other view. And whoever is troubling you will bear the penalty. False teachers will be judged by God. As he's already said in Galatians 1.9, he says, As we've said before, so now I say again, If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Accursed. He wanted to rescue the Galatians there from becoming accursed along with these false teachers. And this was pretty straightforward, right? The whole point of the Christian life is faith, right? We're saved by faith. So what we believe matters. It's not just that we have this amorphous faith like, you know, whatever, God will see me through and we hope He will. No, it's, it's the content of our faith actually matters. If we believe in a Jesus who doesn't exist, He's not going to be able to help us. Or if the God that we believe in is false, He's not going to be able to help us. And I think God gives grace, and I don't know how all that works, but if we get bound up with false teachers and false ideas, we end up in a very spiritually dangerous place. And so on the one hand, we want to be careful not to make friends with false teachers, right? Not to come alongside and support them and get bound up with them. Because there's going to be a judgment for those people who lead God's people astray. They will bear the penalty. And we don't want to end up guilty by association, right? But on the other hand, for the cynic, it's not our job to do the judging. We can discern and confront and debate and disagree and warn others away, but God is the one who is ultimately the judge. And I know some great and faithful preachers who spend a lot of time and energy calling out false teachers. And as much as I appreciate what I think they're trying to do, 
They sometimes just end up looking mean and angry and combative. And there's a time and a place for mean and angry and combative, right? Jesus kicked over tables in the temple. But at the same time, he was Jesus and his anger was measured. James says in James 1.19, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So on the one hand, we want to make sure we don't get caught up with false teachers and end up in their judgment. But on the other side, we want to make sure that we don't put ourselves on God's throne and judge everybody who comes along and condemn everyone we disagree with and end up angry and bitter and mean. And sometimes I think the best response to falsehood is the truth. It's just the truth. When we loudly and confidently proclaim the truth of the Bible, it drowns out the lies. And then it's not our job at the end of the day (laughs) to destroy every false teacher and to own them in debate and to do whatever, to rescue everybody out of the grips of every false teacher. But if we loudly proclaim the truth of Scripture, if we're grounded in it and we loudly proclaim it, we help people. We lead people out of those weird movements and we help people to remember that false teachers will be judged by God. And here's the last one. And I think this one maybe is the most important for our our day and age. Be wary of preachers who are beloved by the world. That's number four. Be wary of preachers who are beloved by the world. Who are beloved by the world. I see this in verse 11 and 12. Verse 11, he says, If I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Apparently, the false teachers in Galatia had tried to convince the Galatians that they were really in line with Paul, that that Paul agreed with what they they were saying that the gospel was really a melding of law and grace and you come to Christ and Christ helps you to fulfill all the old law and then you're doing, then you're saved, right? That's a false gospel. And he reminds them of the harsh reality that he had been cut off from the Jewish community because of his gospel, right? Lest they start to think, well, he's, they're all in line. They're all, they're all teaching the same thing. Paul says, guys, if I'm still preaching that stuff, how come everybody hates me? Why am I still being persecuted? If that's the case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Because he was teaching that the law was no longer binding on Christians. And that's what the offense of the cross is there. That the crucified Savior had rescued his people from sin and death and the burden of the law. And then verse 12, just to make it crystal clear that he was not on their team. He says, I wish that those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Which is another way of saying, I wish they wouldn't just stop at circumcision, but would go ahead and go all the way. And that's some harsh language in the New Testament there. Paul had a lot of enemies. And apparently these false teachers didn't. They didn't have a lot of enemies. They were well-liked and unoffensive. But not Paul. Paul loved the truth and he preached the truth and it led to harsh persecution from everybody. And it seems like he's holding up that persecution as sort of a marker of the fact that he was on God's side and not the world's side. And that makes sense when we consider the words of Jesus in John 15, for example, verse 18 and 19. He says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In fact, the world kind of likes those kinds of preachers The false gospel kind, because they aren't a threat. The world has no need to fight against those who preach false gospels. But those who hold up the word of God as the standard, who say Christ is the only way of salvation, who call people to repent of sin and lay down their lives for Jesus, those kinds of preachers are naturally offensive. And not because of anything in them, but because Jesus is offensive. Jesus was hated by the world. The Pharisees, the secular rulers, the Sadducees, they did not like him. None of them. They all wanted him, not just, not just they didn't like him, they wanted him dead. Because he spoke the truth and they didn't want to hear it. Because sometimes the truth is hard to hear and it threatens the world. And on the flip side, those preachers who are quick to compromise and don't want to offend end up friends with the world. And Jesus says those kinds of people are loved by the world because they are of the world. And so, 
If a preacher or teacher is beloved by the world instead of being persecuted, be cautious and wary because they're probably not telling you the whole truth. And, and I'm not saying that the only trustworthy people are people who have lots of enemies. That's not the point I'm making. But that sometimes you can learn a lot about a person by the people who love and hate them. That's what I'm saying. For example, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to name names, but if Pierce Morgan and Oprah and the ladies on The View all like a particular preacher, that's a good indication that they're not worth listening to. Or if a particular preacher is loved by lots of non-Christian celebrities and they're always at their houses and parties, then that's a good indication that that person is compromised. Now, it could be the case that God has given that person a rare opportunity to speak to the whole culture, but more than likely, that means they have caved on important truths. Let me name a, I'm going to give you a positive example of somebody who I think is genuine and honest and truthful, who really loves Jesus and has paid dearly for it. And that's Kirk Cameron. Whatever you think of him, Kirk Cameron used to be loved by Hollywood, right? He was on several major sitcoms back in the 80s, and then he found Christ. And they didn't turn on him right away, but as he became more and more biblical and more and more vocal, all of his old friends started to abandon him, and the world turned their back on him. And now he's basically outright hated by most of Hollywood, and not because he's mean or angry, like he's one of the nicest people he seems like, but he refused to compromise, and he still refuses to compromise, and he refuses to lie and to soften the truth in order to make friends. And so now he's persecuted by the world. And that's likely going to be the path of every good and trustworthy gospel preacher, and honestly of every Christian, that the world is going to hate them, on some level, to some extent. 1 John 3, 11-13 says, For this is the message that you have heard from me from the beginning, that we should love one another. We shouldn't be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. And that's not, that's not a fun truth, but it is reality. We know this. And you probably felt that, right? You've, maybe you've had conversations with people where you weren't mean, you weren't angry, and they walked away really mad. I've had lots of those conversations. And unfortunately, when we stand for the truth, it opens us to lots of persecution and scrutiny. And yet, that, I think, is a marker of a good and faithful preacher, that they're hated by the world. And that those who are loved by the world, again, I'm not saying that they're wrong. I'm saying, be wary. Be wary. Let me recap these real quick, and then we'll close. Four defenses against false gospels. The first is to stay grounded in the Bible. Stay grounded in the Bible. Paul says in Ephesians 6, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When the Bible fills your mind and your heart and your soul, you can just sense when something is not from God. Number two is approach new teachers with caution. We want to be careful that we don't get our doctrine leavened and ruined by somebody who seems trustworthy but has some weird and bad ideas. Number three is remember that false teachers will be judged by God. That should make us fear a little bit that we, we don't want to end up in their camp. And then lastly, be wary of teachers who are beloved by the world. If all the major secular cultural figures love a certain preacher or teacher, hesitate. Hesitate to trust them. And so if you're on the side of, like you said, if you're on the side of gullibility is too strong. Maybe you're just a really, you're just a nice person and you want to give people the benefit of the doubt. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. But we have to be guarded and careful that we don't fall into the ditch of trusting everybody that comes along. And then on the same, same token, the other side is, like I said, me. I'm a cynic. I don't trust anybody, and that's not good either. I'm working on that. And that's because we want to make sure that we don't close ourselves off to truth that we just don't understand yet. And so as we apply these things, whatever side you fall on, I think they'll make us fall more and more in line with the truth, the beautiful truth, that Christ is the only way. That God so loved the world that He sent His Son, that whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. And that same Jesus who came to save the world said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. 
We want to make sure that that is the anchor and the hope of our souls and that we don't end up in some weird direction estranged from God because we've been drawn in by false teachers. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for setting us free from sin, death, and the law. And we ask that you would help us to stay on the right path. That you would give us wisdom and discernment. That we wouldn't get drawn in by false ideas or wrong ideas or misinterpretations of Scripture, but that we would test everything according to your word. That we would love the Bible so much that we would know it so well that we can just sense and know when something or someone is not from God. Lord, help us to be strong and wise. But on the other hand, Lord, help us to be kind and open and quick to listen and slow to speak. Lord, help us to be people who hope the best of people and yet are ready for the worst, who are wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Lord, help us to navigate this world carefully and cautiously and protect us from the evil one, Lord. Lead us not into temptation, but protect us, defend us, keep us, carry us to the end, pure and unscathed. Lord, we need you to do this. We know that it's by your Holy Spirit that we know any truth at all. And so we ask that you would continue to open our eyes, that we would see you and love you and love the truth more than anything else in this world. We would be willing to suffer the loss of everything so that we could have Christ. Lord, we need you and we love you and we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.